Welcome back to the Real News Network, and reality asserts itself. And joining us again in the studio is Chris Williams. He's a longtime environmental activist and author of Ecology and Socialism, Solutions to Capitalist Ecological Crisis. He's chair of the Science Department at Packard Collegiate Institute and adjunct professor at Pace University. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So if you, you really should watch part one because we're going to pick up right where we left off. Uh, we're the, I guess the general question is, can capitalism provide solutions to the coming and existing climate change crisis or challenge? And uh, as we get into this, uh, you're going to begin to wonder whether it, is, that whether it has such solutions. Thanks for joining us. So I'm going to pick up with something Chris wrote in uh, 2013. Uh, the, the, in September of 2013, the uh, IPCC report came out with its science report, and Chris wrote something called Wall Street to Planet Earth, We Don't Mind and You Don't Matter. And in it, he writes the following. The IPCC report removes any ambiguity from which specific types of human activity lie at the root of these changes. And then he quotes the report. The atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide have increased to levels unprecedented in at least the last 800,000 years. CO2 concentrations have increased by 40% since pre-industrial times, primarily from fossil fuel emissions and secondarily from net land use change emissions. The ocean has absorbed about 30% of the emitted anthropogenic, and that means human caused, anthropogenic carbon dioxide, causing ocean acidification. And Chris goes on to write, even were we to stop emitting greenhouse gases today, industrialized human civilization based on the burning of fossil fuels for energy has set in motion changes to the earth that are essentially irreversible and can only be measured on timescales which are difficult to comprehend. So you start your article that after this report came out, you, I, I think you were a little tongue-in-cheek, uh, <laughs> you thought that there'd be this big collapse of the stock market in New York because everyone would bail from fossil fuels. So you went to look, and what did you find? Uh, no impact whatsoever. The, uh, when I was checking the stocks, there had been um, the, the news that they had to leave up to 80% of fossil fuels in the ground if we're going to prevent catastrophic global warming and climate change uh, had no impact on Wall Street trading of fossil fuel stocks. And you had some and interesting so, numbers on the, in this, the, the amount of fossil fuel that's already owned by the major fossil fuel companies that's in the ground, uh, how much they would lose if they don't get it out of the ground. Now, how much was that? Um, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars and uh, would wipe out large sections of the of the stock market because so much of it is trading in what is a highly profitable industry. In his article, Chris ha writes, considering that a large percentage of its value is based on fossil fuels, in and of itself, all this would be very bad news for Wall Street. The stock exchanges of London, Sao Paulo, Australia, and Toronto have 20 to 30 percent of their valuation from fossil fuels. As of 2011, the top 100 coal and top 100 oil corporations are collectively valued at $7.42 trillion, or half the annual GDP of the United States. If these stock markets suddenly lost up to a third of their value, the effect on the world financial system would be cataclysmic. Previously largest drops in 87 and 2007 8 have exce not exceeded 20%. I mean, what you're saying is if they actually accept the science here, and the repercussions, we got to get out of fossil fuels right away, and, and the economy would go to hell. Um, at least if it's done without some real plan. Right. Um, but that being said, uh, what, what it really means is that there's such vested interest in the status quo by such dominant sectors of the economy that that explains a lot why we're not seeing any change on the political side. Yeah, I think a lot of it is down to, I mean, we're talking about some of the largest corporations on the planet, many of them far larger than most countries uh, in terms of their GDP. And so they clearly have an enormous influence. Uh, I think it's also to do with the ideology of neoliberalism, which is against government intervention for the last 30 years, which um, and deregulation and privatization and so on, and, and reduction in state spending. And that ideology, on top of the vested interests of the corporations, has prevented any real change. And, and so the only change that is allowed to happen uh, if you stick with that kind of ideology, is through um, market regulation. So cap and trade schemes, that's why cap and trade gets promoted, because it's now argued that the government doesn't have a role in regulating what the corporations do. 
and clearly the opposite needs to be the case. And so Wall Street is completely oblivious to, to um, the reality of the, of the situation, as are the fossil well, fuel well, corporations. Well, if, if, if you can get cap and trade actually working, in other words, for any particle of emission, you're going to plant a tree somewhere and create some oxygen. I mean, if you really could get that working, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is that, it, I mean, it hasn't worked. The people where it's been tried most seriously, which is in Europe with the European trading system, uh, emissions have been essentially unaffected by the cap and trade system. They've gone, come down for other reasons to do with a switch to gas. Uh, initially, things like the, the whole uh, economic system changing in Eastern Europe in the 1990s. Um, but uh, the cap and trade system as it's been operating has just been ripe for all kinds of scams by middlemen, brokers. The banks have made off like bandits. But uh, the emissions, even though they've come down in Europe, have come down for other reasons. And that's why they're continuously reforming it. Uh, lots of industries were left out, even in the reformed system that you would want to include, like airlines, uh, like cement production. And uh, the cap is never low enough to have anything done about it. So, you know, carbon emissions are trading at a dollar, two dollars, five dollars a ton of carbon. Nobody's going to change if, if that's the price that you pay to, to buy credits. Uh, and then if you're buying credits elsewhere and you're allowed to pollute, then that doesn't change the reality for the people living around the coal plant. The coal plant still operates but they're hardly paying anything to change. So, so the idea that you could then buy credits elsewhere and continue your operations, if you are a polluting entity above the cap, which is hard to be anyway because the cap is barely a cap, um, then uh, there are lots of local effects which are, uh, still remain. Uh, now, terrible. the advocates of cap and trade, and we'll get into a little more in detail later, but they usually point to California and they say that the cap and trade program in California has been effective. Yeah, there have been definite reductions in California, but uh, what has happened is this problem of leakage that uh, even the UN talks about, that uh, California doesn't have any coal plants, but they still use coal. It's just outside of California. And their exports, so they're exporting some of the emissions so that it doesn't count for California, but it counts elsewhere. And so, yes, it's true that emissions have declined in California, even as the economy has expanded but those emissions have not prevented in total. They've gone elsewhere, either overseas to Mexico or to other states in the United States. So uh, now they're thinking about, well, how do you expand that so that this doesn't happen? But that keeps happening over and over again as emissions get moved somewhere else. And so um, the problem of leakage is, is a huge problem apart from the problem. I mean, what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to trust the banks to come up with a scheme to protect the environment. And, and they're, they're going to financialize without having profit as their primary right. objective. Right, I mean, I, and what we're doing possible. is, yeah, what we're doing is effectively turning another sector of the environment, now the air, the atmosphere itself, that we breathe into a, an exchangeable commodity. And so it now becomes a profitable thing to trade in the atmosphere. And from a philosophical perspective, is that where we want to go? Well, if one forgets the philosophical side, if you're just really pragmatic and say, okay, anything at this point that's effective is a good thing, uh, is there a way to structure this in some way that makes use of the f you know, for-profit mechanism to deal with the threat? I mean, I think there have been a number of different proposals. James Hansen came with a, uh, a, a basically uh, up with the idea that it would, things would be taxed at source. So wherever the mine is or wherever the power station is, they would get taxed uh, for that pollution. And the money that was raised would go back as a rebate 100 percent to uh, the American population in this example. And so that is one proposal that I think is worth considering. But if you're talking about giving money back to ordinary Americans from the corporations, that would meet enormous political resistance, which takes us back to the need for kind of some kind of political reorientation of social power in the country to even get something like that. I mean, I think fundamentally what we're talking about is the need for government to set targets and regulate the coal industry, for example, out of existence. Because the real war on coal, as was pointed out by Paul Krugman recently, is not by environmentalists, it's by the coal corporations. They're, they're the ones who are cutting back on 
uh, coal miners all the time and have been doing so for a whole number of years. And um, it's obviously a dangerous job. We would want to employ those people in well-trained other positions. Um, and I think that those things would exist when you think about the infrastructure uh, in the United States that just got a D plus from the uh, Corps of civil, civil Engineers. So in Chris's piece that I've been referring to, he writes, however, what really hammered the last nail into the coffin labeled, quote, fossil fuel corporations, end quote, and presumably stock markets the world over, and the reason I was so avidly fixated on the opening of Wall Street was for the first time the IPCC report put a budget on carbon. The report indicated that if we're to have any chance of staying below the crucial limit of two degrees Celsius of warming, we could only burn a maximum of 800 to 880 gigatons of carbon, as we have already set fire to 531 gigatons as of 2011, and added that carbon to the atmosphere and oceans, we're only left with approximately 350 gigatons of leeway. So a little further down, Chris writes, how does that number compare to how much we've discovered and is calculated in the reserves of fossil fuel companies and those held by governments, and hence the basis for the valuation on stock markets around the world? According to the Carbon Tracker Initiative report cited above, that number is 2,795 gigatons. 65%, which is the most abundant and polluting source, coal. The portion of reserves controlled by the top 100 coal and top 100 oil and gas companies is 745 gigatons. So we only have 350 gigatons that we can put in without going past this, this mm -hmm. most dangerous point. Um, what does that mean in terms of the value of, of the, what these companies have? And more importantly, uh, as Jim Hansen, James Hansen's pointed out, uh, this is very much about coal when it comes to the United States. Yep, uh, coal, uh, the United States has been described as the Saudi Arabia of coal, has enormous amounts of it, and coal use domestically has gone down, which is actually why the United States emissions have also decreased. Um, and we're already halfway to the, to the emission limits that um, Obama just announced. So uh, then, you know, it's not very ambitious actually at all. But um, as coal is the most polluting um, source of uh, carbon, that's the thing that we need to get rid of most urgently. I mean, there are a host of other reasons to do with acid rain, but also to do with the health implications. The National Institute of Science um, did a study um, and uh, they found that if we closed all the coal plants, we would save about 10 times the amount of money to pay a, a lifetime pension to all of those coal miners than in, in terms of the health care savings that would then amount. So we could more than afford to close all the coal plants, re-employ or pension off all of the coal miners, uh, retrain them, whatever we wanted to do, and save an enormous amount on respiratory ailments, hospital visits, asthma-related uh, uh, causes of pro uh, health problems. Because um, the reality is that coal is not just about CO2 emissions, it's about all of the uh, the acid rain that is caused and also all of the respiratory problems that are caused for humans and other, uh, other animals. So um, we need to really be talking about closing down the coal plants because scientists are saying we, we need to go down by 5% emissions in every year, basically, from now on, and in, and in order to eradicate all emissions from energy and transportation. And so we need to be, the, and the longer that we wait to do that, the harder and harder it becomes. And the, the latest UN report said it's only going to affect the economy if we do the, make these changes by about 0.14%. 0.14%. And so um, actually this would create enormous amounts of well-paid jobs for a whole new energy infrastructure. But we don't do that because so far at least we're wedded to this market mechanism. Correct. But, but in that context, even though I know you and a lot of uh, scientists and environmentalists don't think what Obama did is enough or effective, did at least he open the door that it's actually a regulation. It's not a pure finance mechanism because now you can have debates at the state level how to meet the bar of the federal law. And of course, I think he, he perhaps presupposes that's going to be a financialized cap and trade scheme. Mm -hmm. But it has opened the door that these, this bar can be met in other ways. You don't have to use financialization. No. Uh, 
the, I think, I mean, the, the good thing is we, we, you, you don't need any more new laws. You actually don't need to pass anything through Congress. Yeah, just the EPA regulation. Right, just the EPA regulation. That's what I'm getting at. He's right. used a kind of government intervention, right. which isn't pure market mechanism. Right. Um, in the same way that the EPA re regulates arsenic, for example, or mercury, they now have to regulate CO2. Which was even a Supreme Court decision. Wasn't exactly, it? in 2007. And so, um, in many ways, s the, the, the road is clear, right? Uh, the EPA has to regulate these things as a, as, as a uh, carbon dioxide, as a toxin, uh, harmful to human health. And so, they should be doing that. The problem is that the limits that have been set or, or the, um, the level of ambition is very low. And actually, because it's averaged across states, there are some states, because they've got a more of a mix of different fuels and they're not coal heavy, they, the, the uh, onus is actually on those kind of states rather than the coal states to make reductions. So if you look at the whole plan, the, some of the coal states could actually increase their emissions slightly over the, from, from now till 2030, whereas other states have to radically reduce by more than 30% in some cases. And so the, I think cap and trade may be part of that. Uh, it hasn't worked anywhere else so far, so I'm not sure why we would be doing that. And what about carbon um, tax? I think, uh, I think it has to be something whereby the, uh, the government actually regulates and comes up with, just like Germany did, saying, well, we're going to close all our nuclear plants by 2022 as a result of Fukushima. How are we going to replace that electricity? Let's start planning now and let's invest 25 billion uh, dollars, euros, in a new energy infrastructure to get that going from and wind Germany and was able to do that within the capitalist system. Absolutely. I think that there are real solutions that can be fought for under capitalism. It's not impossible to reorient things. But I think ultimately we need to be talking about a different kind of system because, uh, one, the, the political uh, and economic forces arrayed against us are, are so enormous that we're going to need a huge social movement to make real change anyway. Um, but also, th there's this dependency on ca within capitalism on constant growth. Right, The economy has to always grow, and you can't do that on a finite planet. And now we're finding the limits of what the planet can absorb in terms of the amount of economic activity, not just in terms of energy, but in terms of other attributes of the economy, such as water, for example. Um, and so it's really about how do, capitalism cannot survive without growing, which means that we can't retain capitalism if we want to retain a livable planet. And uh, you know, I, I know which most people would choose. So um, capitalism is pretty short-lived as a, as a social system. And so there must be other alternatives that we can look to that would be more socially just and more ecologically sustainable. Okay, we're gonna continue our discussion with Chris Williams and the climate change crisis on reality asserts itself on the Real News Network. Please join us for the next segment.